So since it's full, I'm just going to get going now. Um, thank you for sitting on the ground. Um, that's pretty hardcore. And I also need to stand in front of my own slides because there's nowhere else for me to stand. So, uh, sorry that my head is like doing that thing. Um, okay, so I'm Sam Kotler. Uh, I work for a company called Red Hat. Um, and we're going to talk about packaging today. So uh, I'm going to cover uh, a few different topics. The first is what is a package and how does it relate to Puppet. Uh, the second is what a provider is and how we can extend Puppet using providers. And the third is packaging environment management, which is going to cover less Puppet and a lot more kind of infrastructure -y things uh, that, is, that are not Puppet. Uh, but I promise it will be related. So what is a package? You probably already know this. Uh, it's basically uh, something that's bundled together to represent a piece of software. So a package, for example, is Apache, right? Um, and, uh, and a package is uh, a resource. So uh, a resource is the smallest part of your dependency tree in Puppet. So you start with, say, a service, right? So uh, let's say HTTPD, uh, the Apache web server. Uh, this definition is in the Puppet DSL, uh, kind of the most basic unit of a thing, uh, and these things can be kind of strung together. You probably already know this if you're using Puppet in some way already. Um, so this service can rely on a file and rely on, on a package, right? So in order to start the HTTPD service, you need Apache. And you probably have some configuration relating to this service, right? So in Apache, you have your HTTPD config, uh, and this config, uh, you want it to be present, and it notifies that service that we defined earlier. So how does this relate to packaging? This is basically the most, the most granular unit of what represents a package. So this will install, if I run this on, say, rel, this will install the Apache package, uh, and obviously it will ensure that it's installed. And from there we can say this package is inside of a class. So we can then have a class called Apache2, which contains a package and a service and some files and templates and custom resources if we have them. This is kind of building on that. Um, this would make it agnostic so that it would run on Debian and Red Hat based systems. You could also make it run on Solaris and Windows if that's your thing. It's magic. Um, so basically, the package uh, uh, resource type in Puppet is just an abstraction of the system management tools, so, or rather the package management tools. So um, you basically, if you look in Puppet Core, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit, uh, there's essentially uh, a D package uh, package provider, and there's also an RPM package provider, and then the yum and apt, which are the, the management tools that access remote resources, are built on top of those. So you start and you're basically subclassing uh, or actually it's kind of superclassing the, the yum and apt repository systems. Um, so um, here's another example, right? So we don't only use system packaging tools. There's also these other tools that language spaces kind of provide. So things like pip and gems, uh, we can manage all these things as well. And they're all kind of under the package umbrella, right? So um, this is the MySQL driver for Python, obviously. Uh, and it's provided by pip, which is in core now. It used to not be in core. Um, and Python 3 adds <coughs> some more packages, package provider types as well. Uh, right, so we have pip. We have gems. Homebrew, if you're using Mac, this is a really useful one. Um, it basically allows you to say, I need this package installed via homebrew, which is a pretty nice package packaging tool, a source-based packaging tool for OSX, Mac ports, think, whatever. Um, <laughs> so each of these things, if you look in Puppet Core, is just a small piece uh, that's provided by the system. So Puppet Core actually implements its own uh, providers, right? So when you say, uh, I need to install Apache 2 on Debian, for example, Core is loading its uh, library system and loading its providers just the same way that you would have if you wrote the app system yourself. So you can also extend, sorry, you can, you can also extend uh, and write your own provider type, which is what I'm going to talk about a bit now. Um, and basically inside of your module, you have modules, plugins, puppet, provider, package, provider name.rb. 
If you look in Puppet Core, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, you will find that there's a pretty similar structure. Um, and this is auto-loaded. Um, so this is the, the kind of wrapper definition for creating a new type. So you're saying, I want to create a new, uh, a new provider of the type package. Provide the type right there would be the name. So you could say, I want to manage Ruby versions as packages via RVM, um, which is a somewhat common use case to do this. And you can define the RVM in installation methods. Um, these providers are really just methods and arrays. So they're actually really simple. You can read the ones in core like a normal human being. They're basically human readable as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and they're all on GitHub. So um, they're pretty easy to extend and alter if you need to. So if you have some custom way of doing things, there's probably a better way to do it than hacking on a provider uh, if you're like extending apt. But these are kind of the very simple definitions. So the first part is commands, right? So uh, for yum, we have user bin yum. Uh, for apt, we have user bin apt get. And we can also say, on certain operating systems, this is the default, right? Um, you might not do this in your custom provider, but it makes a lot of sense when you're doing it in, in kind of other scenarios. So for example, um, if you have separate providers, if you're using RBEMV on one platform and RVM on another, you might have kind of separated um, defaults. So this is just a really simple way to say, um, you know, on Debian, I want to use this. And these values come from facts. So you can use any fact and say, this is a provider based on this fact, right? So this is the default provider for fact OS family, for example, right? This uses operating system, and it would be actually be Debian and Ubuntu. But you can say, hey, based on OS, OS family, so Red Hat or Debian, uh, in the Linux case, this is kind of the, the way to define a default. There's also um, some, loose, some more loose parameters. This is pretty broad and striking, right? You're taking over what the default packaging system is. But there's also defaults for things like uh, uh, just based on generic facts. So if you have, say, uh, your E0 controller, you need to do something with different providers, um, you might do that here. That's kind of a weird example, but it works. So at the core, a custom provider is those, um, those two arrays and then three methods, right? Even the ones in core, I couldn't find one this morning with more than seven methods, and most of them were just called inside of these ones, right? So when Puppet is saying, uh, hey, I have this package in it, always needs to be latest. Every time Puppet runs, I need to be the latest it's calling update, right? When you're installing it, it's calling install. When you're saying ensure absent, it's uninstalling if it's there. These are pretty basic, obviously. You can write any kind of logic into them. Um, and basically, you can look at the ones in core, and they're in lib, all the providers are in lib puppet provider. The package specific ones are in lib puppet provider package. And these are two that you should check out. Uh, if you don't already know this, Puppet is completely available on github.com forward slash Puppet Labs forward slash Puppet. Go look at this code. It's not scary at all. Even if you don't know Ruby, it's not scary. And this is the app. So I'm going to give an example of a provider that's a horrible idea, but I thought was kind of hilarious. Um, Jordan Sissel, who's the author of Logstash and FPM, wrote a provider that calls Chef to install packages. So, <laughs> so you, it's called Swedish Chef. Um, <laughs> uh, if you go, this is where he does stupidity. So if you go to look at this, you'll see Swedish Chef. Uh, and it's actually a pretty good example of how to create custom providers because it does something idiotic, which is sometimes a good way to learn things. So um, you should check out Swedish Chef. Uh, it's also just kind of oddly hilarious. Uh, and it actually did have a use case that he was telling me about this morning, which was uh, before there was a provider for Arch Linux, he used Chef to install packages via Puppet on Arch boxes. So 
that problem has been solved, so this is just a fun exercise now. Right. That's kind of my reaction to it. But, I don't really. <laughs> um, so there's kind of this final part, which is uh, a somewhat large part, because it exists outside of the puppet world. Um, there are packaging repos that are installed on every system, right? So if you're using RHEL, for example, RHEL comes with some base repos, places that you can install Red Hat supported uh, packages from. You can also install your own, right? So uh, EPL, which is uh, an upstream from Fedora, is, is an example, right? Uh, it's a place where you can get packages that aren't in RHEL but, or CentOS main, but you can still install them. Uh, Debian-based distros have the same idea, right? So uh, you can install your own lists. So there's this use case that exists out in the real world, which is uh, there are security constraints and other kinds of constraints where system packaging makes a lot of sense. But system packaging is hard and annoying, and uh, you need to know lots of stuff in order to build packages. Um, and there are a lot of reasons that you would want to, to use system packaging. One of them is just, it's, it's kind of the lowest common denominator, right? If you know how to use RPM and you know how to use YUM or you know how to use apt, you get system packaging. You don't need to learn pip or, um, or the hysteria of gems. You, you just really get these kind of assumptions that you can make out of the box. Um, and there are also some environments in which they just say, RPM is the only way we do things. We never call rubygems.org. We never call PyPy. This is how we just do things. Um, and as I said, uh, you generate some external dependencies when you rely on, say, the gem provider, because when rubygems.org goes down, your puppet run fails. And then you have kind of inconsistent state. So there's this tool that the guy who wrote the chef provider <laughs> also wrote, which is called FPM. The F does not stand for fun. Um, and it's basically an abstraction layer on top of um, all these different packaging tools. It's pretty well documented. So basically what it does is it takes a gem, right? It takes the Rails gem, for example, takes a source and an output, and it generates, so FPM-S gem will say, hey, this is being created from a gem, go fetch it. Dash T, build an RPM of the Rails gem. Right, so this just built you an RPM. Or a Debian package, or uh, an SRPM, or whatever you need to be able to be successful this way. Um, and essentially, this tool abstracts away a lot of the problems. Now, it doesn't fix all of the problems, one of them being uh, if you have architecture-specific native extensions, you still have to kind of build these tools individually because it builds NoArc really well, but it doesn't, uh, sorry, it builds packages that don't require architectural-related things very well, but it doesn't actually handle architecture-related stuff particularly nicely. Um, it can also do stuff that used to be really annoying and you would write a spec file for or a rules file, rules file for. Um, like, it can put just a directory into a package that's pretty awesome. In one command, like you get a package from a directory. So uh, I've seen people uh, build Jenkins plugin uh, RPMs, right? So you have all these Jenkins plugins that are really annoying to manage when you have to redeploy a Jenkins server, for example. And you need a way that's kind of um, succinct and just works really nicely as to how uh, you manage those. And so people build Varlib Jenkins slash plugin slash whatever the plugin name is into an RPM and push it out onto a mirror, and then that's how they deploy upgrades. Uh, I've also seen people like deploy their entire doc route, right? So like you have a WordPress site, let's say. You just put that entire thing into a package and push it and bump the version every single time. Um, this is the most basic example. There are like these huge multi-line FPM statements as well that you can check out. Um, I'll actually publish a blog post about FPM later today. Um, so there's kind of this perpetual thing that has always confused me, and I'm still not sure I have the right answer, but I'll give you my answer, which is packages install all this stuff, right? So like uh, when you install, on Debian it's particularly heavy handed, but when you install a package it does all these things, right? So if your package is installing some web interface in the user share, whatever the package name is, um, 
you have these problems where the package installs stuff and then Puppet manages it, um, and it usually works out fine, but what should be in a package? Like, should a user be controlled by the package, or do you want to manage that informant if you're never changing the user? There are all these kind of weird interdependent tree problems, um, and my kind of take on it is anything that's installed by the package that you need to touch or control needs to also be in Puppet. Right, so instead of changing things in the package and rebuilding the package when you need to change the directory permission, just manage it with Puppet. If you're interested in this topic specifically on Debian-based distros, you should check out this URL. This basically contains a hack, and it is a pretty nasty hack, but it works really nicely, that uh, on Debian-based systems prevents um, post-install, pre-install, and uninstall scripts from running. So if you're trying to uh, install systems where you need to actually have greater control over what's happening when you're installing packages, this will just install the package without any of the pre or post. Uh, if you haven't run into this problem before, it's probably not an issue that you need to worry about. This is still cool though because uh, it involves hacking on dpackage, which is always fun. For me, it's kind of weird. Uh, this is basically the, the modus operandi of that gist. Don't mess things up, basically. Um, it's an anti-pattern that we have maintainer scripts, right, where they're installing all these things, let's fix it, let's manage it with real config management tools like Puppet. Um, and lastly, uh, there's kind of these, these sets of tools that are made for managing packages, right? So you have all these packages that you just built with FPM, let's put them somewhere cool. Let's, uh, let's make them accessible instead of checking them into our puppet tree, which don't do that because your tree will get massive. Uh, I've worked on like two and a half gig, gig, uh, two and a half gig Git repos because people check RPMs into the repo. Don't be that guy. <laughs> Set up when you are. Um, there are these tools that will make it really easy. Um, one of them used to be called YAM, it's now called mrepo, and it's basically a tool for setting up apt and young repos. Um, there's also Reprepo, which is Debian specific, but it's pretty widely used, uh, and it also supports a bunch of different proxy servers and stuff like that. And then there's a project that Red Hat sponsors um, that is called Pulp, and it's basically environment, environment management. So you can do promotions, deletions of content. Um, also, Pulp now supports puppet modules, so you can do environment syncs between different puppet environments using Pulp. It's pretty cool. Um, as I said, it's sponsored by Red Hat, um, and it's available on GitHub. Questions? This is it, that was kind of short um, because I figure there are probably specific questions that people have about how their environment works. So, yeah. yeah so uh, I just have a, I guess, an open-ended question. You know, just sure. asking for uh, potential uh, ways of solving it. So I'm in the business of managing and deploying Hadoop. But yeah. I think it applies to any distributed system. Sure. So one of the things that we have to manage is essentially a rolling upgrade, yep. where we have to basically keep an older system running while still installing and configuring the new system, yep. and gradually, you know, turning every single node sort of very, very gradually to the new system. So yeah. Like every node will connect one by one with the new set of, uh, you know, bits running on it, and you know, at the end of the day, you will have, you know, if everything goes right, a totally upgraded system. Right. Right? So that actually applies in the face of how package management is done on the operating systems, right. because you cannot really easily have two versions of the same package installed. Right. So do we have any suggestions for that? Uh, one of the things I've done is I've pulled the version number actually into the package name. Yeah, that's what we're doing yeah. right now. But yeah, I, I don't get I, I kind of, I felt weird about doing exactly, that, yeah. but it works. Yeah, that's actually a pretty common way to do it, is like, even though your package has a version number, stick the version number into the name, and then you basically, for those, I don't know if everyone could hear, he basically said, he puts the version number into the package name. So what that means is you have like, package, so let's say you have like Cassandra or Hadoop, right? You have Cassandra 1. I don't know what the Cassandra versions are right now, but like 1.7.3-1.7.3.rpm. So you're basically changing the package name each time you upgrade. Uh, and it lets you, because these packaging systems want, they want to force the upgrade when you upgrade the RPM uh, or the dev or, um, or MSI, like you, you run into these issues where you can't have multiple versions installed and you need to upgrade 
your uh, individual versions, and then do you do you have like some way to to move across the entire system to, to like flip over? It's, it's essentially very gradual. I mean, you have two set of systems all right, so you shut down one set of you know demons on on, on the node, right, and you start uh, that very same set, but from essentially a different location. So you might actually end up with you know a symbolic link that you will switch at the end of the operation, yeah. and the rubber stamping that it you know went okay, right? But essentially, it boils down to having just two set of bits and gradually you know switching from one to the other. So it's it's very atypical to have more than two set of bits. I mean, for all sorts of like weird reasons, you might actually have you know more than two. Yeah. But it actually boils down to just two set of bits. Please yeah. call that using at repository level. And then using our EMC to determine which machine to use which repository. That way you don't have to have version numbers anywhere involved. When you're ready to do an upgrade, you cut out a new repository with the versions that you want, change the EMC to, to provide, say, that machine there yeah. is in the new repository, mm -hmm. and then you can move machines to that group. Yeah, and actually Pulp has this feature, so you can say on individual hosts which repo it should be using. So if you're if you have like if they're clustered in some way, you can say cluster one uses the cluster one repo, cluster two, and then you can just do the rolling upgrade mm -hmm. across clusters. I might be missing something, but you can just help that pop it to ensure it's the same version. You can, but uh, he's saying they have two versions installed on one system. Blue green switch. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just, you know, when I roll in switch from the same thing, it's like, yeah, so do you do you install like two services and then you start you stop the old service start the new service? Yeah. And the, the the troublesome part is if there is anything that goes wrong with the new service, you actually kind of have to go back to the old one. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what I need is a version and this is not just a not just so uh, you know the like what works package merge functionality. We are using the same thing as that. Yeah. So this is kind of the the issue that I was talking about, where like these package managers were built in like the 80s or the 90s, where we didn't have these tools and people were like using Perl still. So <laughs> so like they try to take over the system, right? Because they figure some dude is running a script, doesn't care about the other situation, uh, and like doesn't care about the fact that all these files exist, and um, and like just wants them all gone, right? And all the dependencies. So like if you've ever managed Ruby gems with RPM, for example, when you uninstall one of the gems, it realizes Ruby's a dependency and rips out Ruby, right? Like these are not modern tools. These things suck. There's a reason there's an F in FPF. Um, they're really crappy tools. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, I can't see you. Um, you could easily write a CPAN provider. There are actually a few floating around on the internet. Uh, I was just really mean to Perl. Perl's awesome sometimes, like string handling, and it's also weird. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, CPAN is like, it's just a package, right? It's just like a Ruby gem in a lot of ways. Um, it gets installed into a directory, and there's an autoloader, like, you can manage them in the same way. If there isn't a CPAN provider that you can find on the internet, email me and I'll write one because that's important. Yeah, I'm actually, the project that I work on at Red Hat, which I'll talk about in a sec, is kind of potentially going to be the next generation cobbler. So, and also, in related news, I'll go back to that. Uh, I work on the Foreman project at Red Hat. Um, you should come to the talk that Ohad, the project lead, is giving at 2.45 today. Uh, he's gonna, if you haven't seen Foreman before, it's uh, basically provisioning and EMC tool, as well as a foreign tool for Puppet. Uh, it's pretty cool. He'll be giving a demo of liver provisioning, over provisioning, open stack. There's lots of cool stuff going on in Foreman. Um, if you want to ask me formal questions, you can.
uh, in the hallway or something. Uh, are there any other questions? Cool. Well, if you need to contact me, these are everywhere where I am. There are probably other places. Um, but yeah, these are the easiest ways to get in touch with me. Um, cool. Also, I'm Sam Fowler on Freenode. Cool. Thank you for coming. Thank you.